Good evening, ladies. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth, wife of Zechariah the priest and mother of John the Baptist. Oh, where do I start? Well, first I should tell you, I come from good stock. I'm a descendant of Aaron, Moses' brother, the first high priest of Israel. You'd think that with all that good DNA, plus the fact that I married a priest, I would have no problem having children, but it did not work out that way. Zach and I had a great marriage. Life was good, but I was barren. That was not good. And I love the way Dr. Luke put it, and they were both far advanced in years. In other words, we were old and too old to be starting a family. I tried not to think too much about it, but I did find myself asking God, why? Still, I trusted him, and I did my best to accept my lot in life and focus on serving God with the gifts that he did give me. One year, the rotation came around for Zach to go into the temple sanctuary and burn the incense on the altar. It was a once-in-a-lifetime privilege for him, and we were both excited. I stayed outside in the courtyard with the congregation, and I prayed as Zach offered the incense. I'll have to admit that I found myself praying for a child. Lord, with you, all things are possible, I whispered. Little did I know that Zach, at the very same time, was praying for the very same thing. What are the chances? And lo and behold, an angel appears to Zach and tells him, our prayers have been heard. We're going to have a son. I think the angel must have told Zach so much about our son and what he was going to accomplish that he went into information overload. Turns out Zach found it hard to swallow and learned that there are consequences for his lack of faith. He finally came out of the sanctuary but was unable to speak. We realized that he had seen a vision, but it wasn't until we got home and life returned to normal that it all started to make sense. Because guess what? I got pregnant in my old age. What do you say about that, Dr. Luke? God has such a sense of humor. My pregnancy was easy considering my age. I was a bit embarrassed, so I kept myself secluded for the first five months. Soon afterward, my cousin Mary came for a visit. The minute she came into the room, I felt God's presence. My baby leaped inside of me, and I was filled with his Holy Spirit. I blurted out, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. God made it known to me that Mary was pregnant with the Messiah before she even said a word. And when the Holy Spirit fills you with his power, get ready to be blown away. So not only had the Holy Spirit told me about Mary, an angel told her that I was pregnant. Crazy, right? So we spent the next three months sharing details about what was revealed about our sons. We knew God had chosen us to be moms of very special men, and it excited us both beyond measure. We thanked God, and we rejoiced for his most gracious blessing upon us and prayed for his wisdom and strength to raise a baby, to raise our baby boys to be all he created them to be. I'll yield this to Marianne, who has much to teach us. In the words of a godly prophet, she must increase, but I must decrease. Shalom. Well, I don't know about increasing. If I get any more increased, I'm already out of all my clothes. <laughs> so, why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. I had to start with something corny. Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to chapter 1 of Luke. And we're going to look at this biblical account of Elizabeth. And we're going to see that her life was one of devotion and faith. 
There's not a lot of details about Elizabeth, but the details that are there, we can clearly see her character. So let's bow together and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the men and women of the Bible that you have given us, warts and all, Lord, that, that we can see that you love us beside, in spite of our humanity. You created us, and you have deemed to be our God, and we thank you for that. Bless your word now, and, and fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since Zacharias and Elizabeth are an old married couple, I can't really leave Zacharias out of the story. So we're going to start in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abiah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So the first thing that stands out to me here is that this couple, they were in right standing with God, and yet they had their share of hardship and trials. Their devotion and commitment to God and his word wasn't dependent upon God's blessings or the lack thereof. You know, I don't hear them bargaining with God. I don't hear them saying, if God will give me this, then I will do such and such for God. Or they could have said, maybe if I do this, then God will bless me. No, instead it says they were blameless before God. You know, you, you can't manipulate the king of the universe, can you? My faith can't depend upon my circumstances. My faith must be based on what I know about God, who he is, how what I know about him in his character through his word. Zacharias and Elizabeth knew God, and he knew them. This was a, a monumental day in Zacharias' life because he'd been chosen by lot to burn incense before the Lord in the holy place. There were so many priests in Israel at this time that not all of them could serve inside the temple. They all went to Jerusalem three times a year and they presented themselves as servants to the Lord, but they had to choose them by lottery how many could go in. And this is a special blessing. Both Elizabeth and Zacharias come from very godly families, priestly families, and I'm sure, as, as Elizabeth told us she was, um, that she was outside with the people praying. She must have been really proud of her husband. I mean, imagine. No one seems to know definitely what the hour of incense is, but God obviously chose, lot, uh, chose the lot to fall on Zacharias for this specific time, in this specific moment. And of course we know incense, uh, that represents the prayers of believers. So let's pick up again in verse 11. <clears throat> then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Zacharias, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. That's a place of honor. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Drop down to verse 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. How polite, huh? <laughs> and the angel answered and said to him, 
I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So the holy place, the, the inside of the temple, there's two rooms, if you will, the holy place and the holy of holies, which a priest only entered once a year. But only priests were allowed in to this holy place, and only one at a time. So you can imagine how startled Zach was when all of a sudden there's this magnificent heavenly being standing there. I love that the angels always have to tell people, don't be afraid. I'm not going to eat you. <laughs> but he does tell him as well that his prayer has been heard. You know, we don't really know for certain what Zacharias was praying for. It may have been for a son. Maybe he didn't pray in faith, right? Um, but maybe he was praying for the Messiah. Or maybe it was both. Luke in the Gospel of Luke, he frequently links the word joy with salvation. And the angel says, you're going to have great joy. And John the Baptist certainly is linked with the arrival of the Messiah. As the angel describes the, the child that Elizabeth is going to have, it's obvious this isn't going to be an ordinary kid. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Well, it seems that Gabriel, who had left God's throne to be there, didn't take kindly to not being believed, and Zacharias is made mute. And I, I think probably deaf as well, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I'm sure in the following nine or 10 months, Zacharias thought a lot about his failure of faith and what the angel had said. But you know, his lapse of faith wasn't permanent. Failure is never final. Even when we are faithless, God is still faithful. 1 John 3.20 promises, this is a good one to memorize. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. What that means is that in spite of my failures and my sin, God knows that I'm his, and he still loves me. He still loves us in spite of our failures. Failure is never final when you're a child of God. This obviously is apparent at the end of the chapter. Zacharias proclaims that beautiful psalm, um, and, he, and he prays, and he praises, and he prophesies. So we know that failure for Zacharias isn't final. Let's begin reading again, starting in verse 24. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, The Lord has dealt with me in days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among people. So again, not a lot is said about Elizabeth, but we can see she's a remarkable person. Zach had somehow communicated the good news to his wife, and she believed it because she believed God. And of course, in societies like Israel, and even in today's society here in America, a woman's value is largely measured by her ability to bear children. And to be without children often led to personal hardship and shame. You know, she would have been excluded from certain things. Her, her virtuosity would have been questioned. You know, this is happening to you because there's sin in your life. Has anybody ever said that to you? They've said it to me. And you know, you're accountable to one. You play to an audience of one. Yeah, we need to keep short account, short accounts with Jesus, and we need to confess our sins and repent of them. But this isn't because there was sin in their lives. It says they were a righteous couple. 
She was probably pretty resigned to a childish old age, childless, childish too, probably, old age. But you know, she wasn't bitter. Whenever we see Elizabeth speaking, she's praising the Lord. She's encouraging. Your circumstances, my circumstances, they can make us either bitter or better. It's a choice. The key is to thrive wherever God has you. Some of us are married with kids. Some are single moms. Some are widows. Some are divorced. Some have never married. And some, like Elizabeth and myself, were married but childless. But we all have a choice. We can grow and thrive in the purpose and plan that God has for us, or we can shrivel up and be bitter. Wherever you are, wherever God has you, be the best version of yourself. We all have trials. We all have blessings. They are meant to fit us for the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, as we say so often, comparison is the thief of joy. So we need to stop looking around, and we need to look up. God has a work he wants to do in us to conform us to his image. Listen to Psalm 119.71. It teaches, my suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. God's not going to waste your struggles or your pain or your trials. He uses them to make you the woman he designed you to be. A familiar verse, one of my favorite verses, Ephesians 2.10, tells us, for we are his workmanship. What's that Greek word? It's poema. We are his poem. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. God made us, made you, made me, according to his will, not according to my will or to your will. And each one of his poems is unique. You know, if, if, if Shelley or Percy or Robert Frost had written the same poem over and over again, where, where would be the interest in that, right? Each one of us is unique, and he has a purpose for us all of our lives. The word works in that verse is ergon in the Greek, and it refers to our activity, the things that we do. God prepared for us to do those things. He planned out what we are to do with our lives, our entire lives. Seasons come, seasons go. Circumstances change. In all of it, God still has a purpose for us. The phrase to walk in them, is peripateo in the Greek, and it refers to how we live our daily lives. We are to live, not be frozen in fear or regret or bitterness. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come, I have come, that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. If Jesus says that that was his purpose in coming, then I think I should fulfill that purpose, amen? And you know what? I'll tell you what. The abundant life, that's a happy life. We talk a lot about happiness and joy, and joy is a fruit. You want to be happy? Live the abundant life. That's happy. Now I'm going to start talking to myself here. This couple was old. So my age is no excuse. God's timetable, God's methods, they don't conform to what we expect. That means that the season of life, the circumstances I'm in, wherever God has me, I'm to walk in his purpose for me. There's no excuses. My grandfather used to say, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. So don't ever give me an excuse, because I'll tell you that. You don't want to be a sausage, lady. <laughs> Perhaps you recall the uh, story of the loaves and fishes in Mark 6. <clears throat> the disciples, you know, God bless them, they wanted to send the crowd away, and, 
and have them get something to eat because there's so many of them, right? And uh, in that chapter, verse 37 and 38 say, Jesus answered them and said to them, you give them something to eat. And he said to them, and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Well, you know what happens. He takes that scanty little amount and he feeds well over 5,000 people. See, it doesn't matter what you don't have. What do you have? One of my dearest friends is burdened with severe pain. I mean, physical limitations. Can barely drive. But you know what? She's not focused on that. She's not focused that, on the fact that she can't go in the nursery and hold a baby or or she's not whining about the fact that she can't go serve ice cream in the kitchen. Instead, she's made a commitment to be at a weekly prayer meeting. In her pain, she's praying for others. That inspires me. That takes away all my, good Lord, let me never complain again. What do you have? Bring it, in, bring it to Jesus and let him do the miracle. I believe that Elizabeth was a better woman for what she'd suffered. She could have become bitter and complained and made her life and Zach's life miserable. But she remained faithful to God. And you know what? God will not forget those who are faithful to him. The fact that she believed God told Zacharias through the angel shows that she was a woman of faith. She had a heart of faith. And when she became pregnant, she knew God was in control. I can't imagine what that would be like at my age to be pregnant. Good heavens. <laughs> I'd hide for five months too. But we need to remember, don't we, that God is in control of every situation. Let's pick up this story again. We're going to look at this same angel, Gabriel. <clears throat> he goes to Mary of Nazareth and tells her what's going to happen to her, beginning in verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yeshua, Jesus. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered, her, answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. I'm, I'm thinking at this point, Mary's pretty overwhelmed. She's got this heavenly being, and, and he's telling her she's going to remain a virgin somehow and be pregnant. And So I'm thinking, you know, her mind's spinning a little bit. So notice what the angel does. He tells her about Elizabeth. Verse 36, now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Verse 39, now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Ju Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped inside her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke with a loud voice, saying, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Down to verse 56, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. I'm assuming she stayed for the birth of the baby. So within days of Mary's uh, message from the angel that she would bear the Messiah, Mary runs to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is at least six months pregnant at this point, and uh, 
As soon as Elizabeth sees Mary, she and the baby John are filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking through that same spirit. Uh, she greets Mary as the mother of my Lord. She recognizes and praises the Messiah even before he's born. And that's exactly what Gabriel had told Zach, that the baby and, and her would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. What a thrill that must have been, you know? Imagine it. She feels the rush of the Holy Spirit and the baby leaps in her womb. I mean, it gives me chills to think of that. Knowing about the child that Mary was carrying must have made Elizabeth marvel at God's timing. Hey, you know, she wanted a baby when she was 18 and now she's 68. But things have worked out better than she could have ever imagined. You know, isn't that the truth? God's timing, God's plans, they're always so much better than what we can concoct. Besides being relatives, Elizabeth and Mary had a special bond. I like to think that they were cousins. The Bible doesn't say that, but cousins are special, aren't they? They're kind of our first friends, and, and so I like to think they were cousins, but I, I don't know. But they had this special bond. First of all, they were the first women to hear the coming Messiah, and they both had miraculous pregnancies. But they were also bound together by their love and faith in God. Elizabeth knew that John would be the messenger for Mary's son and that Mary's son would be even greater than hers. But there's not a trace of jealousy or envy. She's not comparing, well, geez, your baby's going to, you know, she's not doing any of that. What a beautiful moment for these two women. What a what a, I believe that they both knew at that exact moment their purpose and their plan that God had for their lives. I'm thinking Mary probably, she's young, she's very young. Mary needed the encouragement of Elizabeth and, and, and so she goes to her for that encouragement. Mary is a young woman. Elizabeth is an old woman. Elizabeth had walked with God for many years and, and she assures Mary that their God would do those things which he had revealed to Mary. Elizabeth was confident in God, and Mary needed confidence. So that's what Elizabeth shares with her, that confident faith. This is, a, this is an important point for us. This is an opportunity for us. Titus 2 tells us that the older women are to live in a way that honors God by teaching the younger women what is good. Those who have life experience, who have walked with the Lord through trials, we have the responsibility to share what we have learned with other believers. Some of us have been Christians a long time. Uh, you know, we, we have wisdom that comes from our, our failures, frankly. You know, I, I haven't learned anything from my successes, but I've learned a lot from my failures. Some of us are new Christians, and we, we have questions, we have doubts. Wouldn't it be loverly if we all came together and helped each other? You know, that's what I love about this. That's what we do. You know, there, there's, there's young, and there's old, and there's seasoned believers, and there's newbies. You see, God uses our differences to help one another. If we were all the same, what would, what would be the point? How boring that would be anyway. Elizabeth was only a woman, just as Mary was only a woman. But Elizabeth played a very important role in the advent of the Messiah. She discipled his mother. Think of that. All right, let's read on beginning in verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. 
So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But his mother said, no, no, he shall be called John. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to the father. See, they're having to sign to him, so I'm thinking he's deaf at this point. He couldn't hear the conversation. They made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, his name is John. And so they all marveled. Zach and Liz have followed their faith. And in their faith, they have John circumcised on the eighth day. The circumcision performed on the infant at that point is called a brit milah, or in the Yiddish, bris. I'm sure maybe some of you have heard of it. And the ceremony includes the announcement of the, the child's name. And then there's a meal afterwards. It's a major event in the life of a Jewish boy. And, and uh, there's a party, and it's a very happy time. In those days, of course, and we do it still today, not as much, but the, the child, the first child especially, was named after the family. And if it was a boy, he got his father's name. He became a junior. So when the question of naming the child came up, it was assumed he'd be called Zacharias. Elizabeth made the correction, but appealed to Zacharias because it was the man's responsibility to name the child. In naming that child, he claimed the child as his own. He wrote out for them, his name is John. He'd already been named by God, so we kind of skim over that. Well, yeah, his name is John, we know that. But think of it, it's so beautiful that Elizabeth and Zacharias are on the same page. You know, if you're married, I, I'd like to encourage you just a little bit. My night, Stephen and I are gonna be married 39 years next month, and I know there's people in this room who have been married longer, and, and they will attest, it's the Lord who held us together. It's the Lord. We've, we've had our struggles, but we've hung in there, and it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, like Zacharias and Elizabeth, Steve and I have outlived most of our problems. You know what I mean? The, those things that, man, I, you thought were so important, they really don't matter. You know, is this a hill you want to die on? Hmm? Really? in a year, in a week, in a month, is this going to matter? As soon as Zacharias named the baby, he was able to speak again, and he began to praise God. And although he had lacked faith in the beginning, when the baby was born, he rejoiced. I'm sure that during the months when he was unable to speak and hear, that Elizabeth was a great comfort to him. She became his mouth, she became his ears. And I think that the, the lack of faith that Zechariah starts out with is something many of us have. When God answers our prayer, boy, we, you know, yay, God. We praise the Lord, right? But when we learn to rejoice in all our circumstances, we become strong, and that is when we gain a heart of faith. So I, I, I just... To summarize, these are the things that I saw that Elizabeth, with her faithful heart, these are the things I, I saw that I could apply to my own life. Like Elizabeth, the more we know God, the more faithful we will become. Failure is never final as a child of God. And wherever you are, be the best version of yourself. Don't compromise. God always has a useful purpose for you. And God will use our differences to help each other. Finally, be faithful to praise God in all your circumstances. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we, we come before you and we are just weak vessels, Lord. 
Fill us with your grace, Lord. Make us vessels of mercy. Pour us out to one another. Pour us out in love and in joy. God, I, I lift up any woman in this room who is bitter or dissatisfied with her circumstances. I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill her, would heal her, would give her a vision of your purpose and your plan for her life. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather here in your name in peace and in freedom. I pray that you bless the table time. I pray that you speak to their hearts, open their hearts to receive all that you have for them. I ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.